of the, the other outfalls serving the area. Um, I think that related to that question is the village's continued uh, maintenance for programs for the existing systems to ensure that there aren't any blockages or um, failed pipes within the system. So it's, to my knowledge, there nothing has changed in that vein. And then just one last one, and it, and it does tail, dovetails off a question that President Kukla asked. So is the key, as we look at the village as a rectangle, right, and they have some separate um, stormwater systems throughout the village, as you explained, kind of just focusing on the south facing portion, um, you know, without additional outflow options, whether that be deep tunnel or uh, the quarry or the McCook ditch, what are the options, if any, to try to in improve this? Or is the place to start with the outflow and work your way back, in your view? The outflow provide the most, the improvements to the outfalls and the outflow rate provide the greatest improvement for project cost um, for the alternatives that we've looked at and considered and that have been previously considered by others. However, there are things that can be done to incrementally improve stormwater within the village. That includes green infrastructure improvements that promote infiltration, so you have less of that water draining to the sewer systems. Um, there are you know, storage opportunities. You could provide stormwater storage in a park area, for instance, um, that could help reduce the stormwater draining to the system. But as I stated earlier, because of the volume of stormwater that needs to be managed, a lot of those system, a lot of those types of improvements aren't going to fix the problem. They're just going to provide a small benefit, and are ideally would be implemented as a supplemental project to a larger conveyance project. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Matucci. Any other comments, questions? Okay, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Siegfried. Uh, if you would wait for uh, to hear what, at least listen to what the residents have, I'm not sure if we'll have you come back and address anything or not, but I'd appreciate it. Absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to, again, normally we would wait uh, to the portion on the agenda where there were matters, not, uh, comments regarding matters not on the agenda. I don't want to do that. Uh, I do want to hear uh, anybody who wants to speak. I know the board wants to hear uh, anyone who wants to speak. So at this time, I would invite people forward. There's, you know, maybe line up one or two, but not everybody line up at once. And um, we'll, we'll try to move it. I want everybody to get to say their piece, but generally we, we think three minutes is, is about fair. And you have to state your name and your address. You do not have to live in LaGrange. Oh. Thank you. You don't you, you do have to state your name. Okay. Hi, I'm Cindy Brahm and I live on the seven hundred block of Kensington and I've lived there for twenty two years. Six years ago I was one of the campaigners to pass the referendum. Six years, nothing has happened. I, I really just basically want to say I, I am wondering where the sense of urgency is here. I had to find out on the website today that the deal fell through in December from the quarry where we have the MWRD and um, Dan Lipinski all taking credit for this great deal that was brokered and it turns out to not be an engineering option. We really need to know what plan B is. It's, it's like we put all of our eggs in this basket and you know, it, this stuff has been happening behind closed doors for six years and the residents haven't been informed. I'd love to talk to my neighbors about how unhelpful the quarry is in our neighborhood in terms of those trucks that speed by, the cracks in the foundation. You know, their Cub Scout hot dog days is once a year is not enough. I also would like to say, this is not just a climate change issue. My husband is called, my kids call him Mr. Doppler because he watches the weather every time we panic that we're gonna have feet of water in our basement. And we got a little, measure thing in our backyard 
And this, this time it had three inches in our backyard on the corner of, or, or on the 700 block of Kensington. The big one that came from countryside, maybe it was 2010, 2014, it was seven inches. And it wasn't as bad. Something's different. The rain stopped this time and the river kept coming. I've, tra I've traced that river. It goes from Highlands and countryside through the country club onto 51st and Brainerd. You know, the, the, one of the other options is that rebuild of Brainerd. I'd like to know, is it higher than it used to be? Did Brainerd used to be able to drain? Because they, this is much more free. I don't know how to express the rage and the grief and the hurt at the village, at all parties involved. What is taking so long? This, this pipe dream of a 50th Street sewer, which may or may not work out, is not enough. There has to be a now action plan. We can't bank on this, like you know, you said. We cannot, this cannot be the only plan. There has to be other mitigation efforts. And a lot of that, I think, comes from LaGrange Country Club. I have rivers and rivers and rivers of water draining from that freaking golf course. And I think my home and my safety and my security is more important than somebody's golf game. Additionally, with all due respect to Counselor, Cook County is the second most crowded docket in the United States of America next to LA County. If we think this litigation is going to happen in the next year or two, it's crazy. Especially with all the things that have happened, all the trials that have gotten pushed back due to COVID, that's no chance that's going to happen. Zero. So what are we going to do in the meantime? How are we going to fix this in the meantime? Can we get a couple more berms? I, I, I emailed the city. We, I talked to President Kukler last year. Six or seven different suggestions. All were dismissed. All were economical. Listen to us. We know what we need, and no one's listening. And it's infuriating, and it's... To keep the water from our, uh, our foundation. Five feet of water in my basement um, last year and this year. Um, I have a photo on my phone that I will share um, with the fire hydrant that's on the corner of 50th and Spring. Um, it's identifiable by the little tiny... Identifiable by the little tiny nut at the top. Um, if there was a fire and, and our electrical panel was underwater, uh, I'm sure many other people's probably were too, but if there was a fire at our house, what would have happened? I got a tornado alert on my phone um, at or around the high water mark. We couldn't get out of our house. We couldn't go to our basement. We couldn't go to our neighbor's basement. What are we supposed to do? Um, do the uh, engineers and the attorney that spoke earlier? I'm sorry, council trustees. That sounds like a lot of blah, 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 really, to all of us. I, I didn't hear anything new. I heard a lot of... Um, what I'd heard through rumors in terms of from the trial attorney. And with respect to the engineer groups, gentlemen, I, I think anyone who's lived in this village for more than a year could probably have shared most of those conclusions, perhaps not as scientifically, but we've seen the water. I, I wonder. It, and, and I apologize for my tone of voice. I'm not trying to be accusatory, but I wonder if you or you, anyone in your firm has been here when the water is flowing and at the high mark, high mark, rising, falling. Have you seen it with your own eyes? Again, we're, we're not going to be I, asking I questions. You, 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 I've heard your question, though. That, that is a question I have. Um, so, and another question I have is why... Why was the engineering firm hired in 2014, I believe they said? And that's the best we have? 
that's the, the best that we can come up with is that report. And why was the trial attorney firm hired only two months ago? I, 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 I come here sweaty and um, stinky today because uh, with my apologies to, to the, this chamber, but we don't have any hot water. We don't have air conditioning. And I've based, barely sat down since Saturday afternoon when we started hauling stuff out of our basement. And um, it's, I came here because I want you folks who, ha I know Mike Mattucci has witnessed it, but I want the, those of you who haven't witnessed it to feel the, just the hurt, the anger, anguish over what it is to be hauling your possessions and your old pictures out of your basement. Um, and never mind the, the expenses. Um, and I, I believe, I'm sure I'm over time, but um, I would ask this group for transparency um, and uh, just urgency. You know, I, and what if we lose this lawsuit? What if we go to trial? Thank you. Thank you very much for talking. Obviously, no need to, uh, to apologize. Uh, we appreciate you coming tonight uh, and, and speaking. So thank you. Not just 
the day of the, the, the storm. It's all the days after that. Even when we have the correct insurance that most of the people that are here right now don't even know about. I have people that have been living in this neighborhood for decades that don't even know they can have flood insurance. That, I mean, these are what people are dealing with every single day. You see, these are actual issues. So not in addition to you deal with the, just the anxiety and the fear of having to go through the actual storm, that is to try to get your insurance company to actually help you. You're victimized again and again. I speak for myself, I can speak for my wife, and I'm sure I can speak with every other person that's here. I, I, I probably have PTSD. That every single time a raindrop comes out of the sky, I start to look at the corner and wonder, is it gonna happen again? That's what it's like for this to happen to me. And I can tell you, you know, Dan, I'm a lawyer too, I'm a trial attorney too. And I can tell you, we can give them all the pictures we want, the law is dispassionate. It doesn't give a damn about what people actually feel. What matters is what side the law is on. Right, Dan? If it's on the quarry side, we lose. Again, Brian, we can't engage in the, in the well, question and answer. I know Dan knows Dan well what I'm talking about. And if we lose that, then what's next? Then another 10 years we wait for you guys to figure out what the next solution is going to be or what it's not going to be or maybe this is going to be incremental, it might work or might not. Let's do something. Let's do something to solve this problem. You guys have failed us every single day. This happened a year ago and we're still doing this again. And you guys are going to go home tonight and talk to your wives or your husbands and say, well, I really feel bad for those people. And tomorrow is going to be a different problem, that, not even really a problem, some other issue you're dealing with. And this is going to be forgotten. This needs to be on the front burner every single day, on the tip of your tongue, every single day until it's solved. Thank you. Playroom, about three to four feet of water in our garage. I have a one and three year old who we had to carry on our shoulders out of our home. Um, I'm not here to accuse anyone of anything. I'd like to share our story and know what the village is going to do to support residents now. We've spent thousands of dollars to haul sewage soaked debris out of our home over the last 48 hours. Um, we have not received a phone call from the village to tell us what to do next. And thankfully, our lovely neighbors, neighbors told us about FEMA insurance, but unfortunately, we were not notified by the village of what we could do to protect ourselves, protect our homes, knowing that the village knew that we were purchasing what we thought was our dream home in a flood area. Unfortunately, our home is totally uninhabitable. It looks like it will be at least a month before we can get back in. We are displaced, we have no hot water, no AC, and our two cars were totaled, along with a lifetime of memories, strollers, car seats, and we are scarred from this, emotionally scarred. We'll go through years of PTSD, and my children saw the devastation. So that's my story. I would like to know what the village is going to do to support us immediately so we can get back in our home and start our life. Thank you. Good evening, Joe Fedora, 217 West Terrace. Um, I'm here just to give you a couple of stories from the uh, two and three hours lot.
covered by four feet of water. So you actually couldn't even read the sign that designated there as a cavern. And although there were public servants out, apparently in some parts of the range, they were nowhere near us. So first thing that I would recommend is we need to be more diligent with the safety of the neighborhood. Um, the second thing is, is of the residents that I pulled in those two blocks, um, nine out of nine had between eight inches and three feet of water in the basement. Um, in my particular case, it was only eight inches, but that's with running two sump pumps out into the yard and then another utility pump that still couldn't keep up with the water. Um, I've been here for over 20 years. The only time I come to these meetings, and this is probably the least favorite thing that I like to do is come to these meetings. And I know you know I've been here before. I've been coming here since 2000, so even though we're talking about 2014 problems, they've been persisting for a lot longer than that. Yeah. And I do concur with some of the folks here that have said, it just seems like nothing's happening. Um, we develop action plans for smart people. There's a lot of brain power in this room. We should be able to figure this out. It should be. It should take a hell of a lot less than 20 years to figure it out. Um, the fact that we're paying more in taxes for storm. When I moved in in the 90s, I was paying five grand a year for my taxes. Now I'm paying almost $25,000 a year, and I'm getting water. Um, I've been working the last couple of days just like you folks. Um, we have a significant portion of our house that has been damaged. Thank you. We just need answers. The, the court, the, the litigation may or may not work, but what's the next plan? Um, I, I suggest you get some of the people of the community together, um, especially some of us that have been around for over 20 years that have experienced this for more than 20 years, and every year, the PTSD, every time it rains, you know, okay, what do we gotta do now? We know we felt, we felt it, we've got contractors, we have lawyers, we have a lot of smart people here that can help the village, and I think that's, that's we need some help. We need you guys to help us, but we can help you as well. So, you know, whether litigation works, whatever's, whatever we need to do, we need to get done. But the one thing that I also want to make you aware of, aware of is that there are problems north of 47. And if you go to Harris and Catherine, you'll be able to see it. Um, I've got all my stuff outside right now, and I'd love to know what the village could do for us to get rid of our, our now, our damaged stuff, our refuse. Um, the lawyer's talking about a settlement. That's fine and dandy, but what about a class action for the poor lady? <laughs> I feel bad complaining about a couple of grand or, you know, over the last 20 years, it's hell of a lot more than that. But, I mean, what are we talking about here? You know, great, we're, we might fix the problem in 10 years. I might be dead in 10 years. I might be gone in 10 years. The fact is, I've been living for 20 years in fear of all of this situation, and I'm sure there are a lot of other people that are in the same boat. Um, we just need to get the next. Hello, my name is Jan Geary. I live in the 700 block of South Kensington. I've been in my house for 42 years. The first 35 years, we didn't have a drop of water, not a seepage, nothing. Since 2014, we've have had the three floods that we've had to replace all our mechanicals, our furnace, our hot water heater, our washer dryer. The basement is a family room for my sons, uh, all the carpet, all the furniture. I feel like Groundhog Day. I just keep waking up and it's happening all over again. Uh, seven years ago, we talked about berming Brainerd Avenue so that the water couldn't flow as a river, as it does, out of the country club. Nothing's ever been done with that. Uh, Jan Reagan had said, we're kind of stuck between the two and we are. One won't let us dump the water. And to me and my husband, we both feel the country club is one of the biggest problems we have in the country club section of LaGrange. So I just would like a little bit more communication from the village. I will say I filled out one of those forms online and Russell Davenport called me back today, talked to me. It was the first person that kind of made me feel like somebody in LaGrange did care, so I wanted to call him out and say thank you. Uh, appreciate somebody coming out and seeing what we are living through. But something changed seven years ago in LaGrange. I don't know what it is, but again, I've been here for almost 50 years. And we had nothing for all those years. 
So we have to figure it out. So thank you. Thank you. I'm Patty Ernst. I live on the 400 block of South Kensington, and my heart goes out to our southern neighbors. Um, but we're, we're getting it too, not as bad. But it, ever since we've been getting the 100 year flood since, since at least 2010. You know, back then I filled out a form and the village came out and said, well, you know, one of the things that really bothers me is that it's all put on us. I'm supposed to come up with $20,000 to have to stop the water from backing up into our basement. You know, we're already paying a lot in taxes. I know you don't get it all, but you know, this is, it seems to me, I think as someone said earlier, we have enough bright people in this community and willing to roll up our sleeves and work together and you know, let's really do something here. I mean, really get aggressive on, from several fronts and I'm, I'm willing to be a part of whatever. But um, they did fix the, well, they fixed the street on Kensington and they changed it so that we wouldn't have, and I don't know, all the engineering of it so basically it comes right down in front of our house <laughs> so now instead of the water going to the end we've got sewers there's four sewers now two in front of ours and our poor neighbors across the street from us she gets it constantly and it... help we need help thank you <laughs> hi i'm uh, chuck rickman i live in the uh, 600 block of ninth avenue um same thing, I feel horrible for you guys. We had three feet last year. We survived this year. Um, my thing outside of the stories that you've heard is more about the traffic management plan this last time. We, we blocked off LaGrange Road and we funneled all of those cars right into our neighborhood. So me and all my neighbors are trying to keep the basins clear so the water keeps draining. And you've got cars flying through at 30 miles an hour throwing the water up against our houses and I'm like, why are they doing that? And then I find out it was because LaGrange Road was closed. So as an immediate type plan, if we're gonna close LaGrange Road or close a major artery, let's do it all the way and send them to another major artery like East Avenue or somewhere else, rather than into the neighborhood where all of us are in the street trying to do what we can to protect our homes. So. Hi, my name is Julia Fullerton recently moved here in October of last year from Texas, where we don't have basements. <laughs> and we don't have flooding either like this, unless you're living in the Houston area. We are from Dallas, so didn't deal with anything like this. Did as much research as possible on the area, fell in love with it from the great state of Texas, and we're very excited to move here. I dealt with true life and death crisis in my family more times than I can count. And I spoke with my mother the other day, and she asked me, how is everything going? And I told her, we're all healthy. And as long as this doesn't bankrupt us, uh, then it's just fine. We'll get through it. It is unfathomable to lose personal mementos, like well, wedding albums and baby pictures that you will never get back. I want to stress the severity of how disgusting it is and unsafe health-wise when we are dealing with human human is six feet tall. Our basement was well fortified by the previous homeowners, but it was not enough. Came in through our garage, came in through the basement up to his kneecaps. When I was younger, my little sibling, he was two years old and he got a staph infection. We lived in Section 8 housing because that is what the Marine Corps provided my family. And I asked my mother how he got a staph infection. She said, I have no idea where you pick these things up. Human feces is one area where you can pick things like that up. I have an almost two-year-old son. It is disturbing to live like that, surrounded in such a state. When we already have hospitals that are overwhelmed, first responders that are overwhelmed, taking our call on something like this, there should have been some between what this was happening in 2014, I wasn't here, um, but it's unbelievable the timeline that's happened over the years. Having sandbags put out, having barriers put out, there could have been a lot more. There are a lot of capable people in the neighborhood. All of my neighbors explains why people stay here. It's like working for a bad boss, but you have really amazing coworkers, so you stay. <laughs> <laughs> Say 
I really appreciate my neighbors, especially Kelly and Brian for warning us about and telling us to get FEMA insurance. Uh, that really saved us, so thank you. Uh, if anybody else needs anything, you know where I'm at. I'm at the Vortex on the corner of Spring and 50th. <laughs> thank you. Rob Byerly, 700 block of spring. Um, you know, I guess I'll start by stating the obvious, which is everyone over here is speaking President Kukler uh, with the, the deepest sense of frustration. And so it, it was curious, I suppose, to start the meeting with a plea to support local LaGrange businesses when I can tell you emphatically that, that no one sitting over here feels like the community and indeed the board supports them. So I ask you to reflect on that and think about um, the support mechanisms uh, that, that you envision. <clears throat> I've lived in LaGrange for four years, only been flooded twice, so I count myself lucky. I came here tonight to learn a little bit about some action plans. Um, the, the first illuminating thing was that this became a top priority for, for you, your words, top priority in 2014. Uh, and then I heard from an attorney who's been on the job for two months. And magically today, uh, for the, the board meeting, he got a call from the, the title insurers, and there's, there's going to be something great happening. So that's amazing, two months. It does beg the question, what has happened for the previous six years and ten months? I'm all ears. And what I would tell you, sir, is if it's a top priority, and it, somehow the silver bullet for the title attorneys works out, in the two season construction works out, you're operating in a nine year time frame. I would be embarrassed if I operated on a nine year time frame for my top priorities. What the hell else do you do in life? Get it together. You should be embarrassed. That's what I have to say. So I live on the corner of 47th and Spring, and luckily we weren't as flooded as bad as you are, but this is two years in a row where our place has been wiped out. Again, raw sewage coming in. I was not aware of the pipeline cut through the Hanson Quarry. We sit in this meeting, again, you've been addressing this issue for, as they said, since 2014, against the evil quarry. I watched the citizens of Willowbrook come together and take a corporation out <coughs> because they had some air issues. By the way, getting a permit as he did not answer through the Illinois EPA to get this pipeline put in. Well, I had at least another year of your timeline, so two years plus permitting is going to be a problem. But as a citizen group, we should come together and take out Hanson Quarry. I would ask the police chief, along with the police chief of the countryside, the police chief of Western Springs, to get together. And every morning, I am a DOT official for a trucking company. The trucks that run up down through our town down 47th Street. God knows where they go because there's semi-trucks driving into Hensdale. No trucks allowed there. Driving up down Wolf Road, wherever they go, they're not, they're over the limit. They have no brakes, they have no lights. You can put them out of business. Between the four chief police, you can kill Hanson Quarry. We as citizen group can take them out as well. We can start to call the TV stations, the press, and we can eliminate them because those are scumbag trucking companies that work for those quarries. They're not legal trucks. Get the Illinois State Police. Trust me, they'll do it. They'll come out here, sit outside that quarry, and deadline every truck. You'll have trucks backed up and down 47.3 for 15 miles every morning. They won't be able to go anywhere. We can put pressure on Hanson to cooperate with this village, but we can shut them down. So I will start to work on a Facebook page that we eliminate Hanson Court. We will take them out and make them the bad neighbor. We will make national television if we have to. But unfortunately, this board is going to take some meat too because you guys have had sat here for seven years and done nothing but take our tax dollars. And this is ridiculous. It has to stop. I'm with you. I'll make calls, do whatever. Um, uh, my name is Deborah Reed. I live on the 400 block of South Edgewood Avenue. Um, I'm so sorry for everybody south of 47th. We didn't have as bad as you guys, but anything is more than we need to be getting. Um, we bought our house in 2015. We had no issues with water inside our house until last May when we got about an inch of sewer water inside our basement through the floor drain. 
Um, that was a devastating experience, which was unfortunately repeated this Saturday. This is two times too many. I reported the issue to the village the first time last year, then figured it was a rare occurrence, but now I'm not so sure. I looked on the village website and the information provided is from 2015. I did some more research and found from the meeting minutes over the last year that there are a few, there are a few sewer projects, which were discussed tonight underway, that have been held up by lawsuits with the quarry um, and funding. I also learned that other villages in our area, like LaGrange Park, currently offer relief programs to help residents install sump pumps and injector pumps to help keep water out of their homes. What is LaGrange doing to move forward with these sewer projects, and what is LaGrange doing to help residents in the meantime? Um, some assistance, I mean, like, LaGrange Park is right next to us, and if they can do this, why isn't LaGrange? Um, we need some help working with this. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? My name's Allie. I live with my neighbors on the 700 block of South Spring. I moved into my home, my first home, thinking that I made it, thinking that I had Finally, a safe place that I could call home, that I could get married and have a baby and start a family. I was eight and a half months pregnant when the first flood happened last year. I stood in my basement with a mop bucket catching sewer water in the basement because I felt like I had to do something. My dreams literally were coming through my window well at me so fast that I couldn't stop it. I had to be forcibly removed from the basement by my husband. But I couldn't leave it because I literally saw my dreams dashing away from me. Last week was my daughter's first birthday. On her party, we had to send all of our guests home because the flood started happening again. That was her first birthday party. The pictures of my house with the one of a balloon were literally cut in half by the water. That's how I'm gonna remember my daughter's first birthday. That is how I'm gonna remember my pregnancy. Scared and alone. And I urge you to understand that this isn't just a flooding problem. This isn't just a little bit of water in your basement. I have five feet, by the way. This is my life. This is my future. These are the memories I'm going to have forever. Forever. My life. I want you to go home tonight and realize that we have amazing people in LaGrange. We have amazing, smart people. And we are so focused on one little solution to this problem. And what if it doesn't happen? What are we going to do? <clears throat> I know it's rhetorical. I'm not allowed to ask real questions. That's just a rhetorical question. We'll, we'll try to at least answer generally. Thank you. I appreciate it. My husband deserves a paycheck from LaGrange for all the work he does, along with my other neighbors. Both of us have been checking on our neighbors consistently because we understand what it feels like to undergo such copious amounts of stress. He goes out, like I said, we have a young baby at home. During the 2 a.m. feeds, the 3 a.m. feeds, he is monitoring the street for our neighbors, for our home, to protect them from going through something like this. He was taught by a very fine neighbor of ours how to remove the top of the sewer grates to help them go down faster when they get collected with leaves. That's not what normal people living in areas have to do at night. That's not normal. That's not what you do in a nice suburb like the Grange. I mean, we live in an area where people should be coming in droves like they should 
because it's a great place to live, but not with this problem. It is not a citizen's responsibility to have to stand in sewer water and remove sewer breaks. I found out about three days that I was pregnant and the street started to flood. I went out there and I removed the grate with my neighbor and I stood on top of it, risking my life for my home, for my neighbors, and for their dreams because I didn't want to see anyone else's dreams go down that drain or into their basement. I didn't want to see it. I was willing to do that. Now, what are the people that are paid to do it? Are they risking their lives for it? Are they up at 2 a.m., 3 a.m.? Are they looking at their phones consistently about what the rain is going to do? I want to know. Because I'm paying taxes, but I think I should be paid for standing on top of the grate, protecting all other people. It's ridiculous. And I just really, I understand that everyone has the best intentions, or at least I really hope that I believe in the good of people. But I, I, the urgency, it's just not there for me. And I really need it. That's all. Thank you. Hi, I'm Lindsay Paulus. Um, I'm a realtor in town. And I sold, I was a listing agent on two properties, uh, one of which the Casey's um, purchased recently. I actually used to live in their house and I loved it. And I still love that house, by the way. And I just moved three doors down, um, stayed on the same block. Um, I love our block, I love this town. Um, I've lived in the area my whole life and I want to be able to sell real estate in this town forever because it's a great place to live and we all love it. But this is a very impeding issue on our lives, um, our livelihoods, and I just really hope that we can get this taken care of. And I'm so sorry that you've had the problem that you've had. And Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, again, thank you for everybody coming and, and thank you for sharing uh, truly your horror stories. Um, I can speak for everybody up here. We, we do feel your pain. We do understand your frustration. Many of us have had flooding um, at various times. Uh, so we've gone through it, but even the ones that haven't, I know, feel your pain uh, and your frustration. Um, so, so I want to make that clear. Um, we're not here to make excuses. Uh, that's not what I'm trying to do by, by responding uh, in any way, um, is to make excuses. Uh, I do want to make clear that we're residents and we're volunteers. You know, when you ask me what do I do all day, I hope you know I don't sit in this building um, because I'm a volunteer. Um, I do spend a lot of hours a day volunteering, but that's what I am, I'm a volunteer. So um, again, we're all as a board doing our best um, and, and we'll continue to do our best. Uh, and I know that we understand your frustration. We understand why you're angry. And, and I think we know that kind of comes with this role. Um, so I, I don't hope that nothing I say would, would in any way um, take away from that. Um, to use a phrase that was said, you know, two crappy neighbors, one to the west and one to the east. Uh, Perhaps um, I fully, fully support all citizens and any actions against the quarry. I, I find them to be an unbearable neighbor. 
Um, I think that, by and large, they are 100% profit-driven and do not care about the impacts to our, to our village, uh, whether it's the blasting, the impacts of the blasting, the vibrations, the dust. I do not think they care. They care about money. Um, they, they, should an open pit be able to take water and have the water flow from the west side of the quarry to the east side of the quarry and be pumped out? Absolutely. Can you convince me that that shouldn't occur? You'll never be able to convince me. I contacted the quarry and said, let's figure out a way that you can be fairly compensated to take the water from the west side of your quarry through the quarry to the east side of the quarry and have it pumped out. Not interested. Don't want to discuss that. That's why I said before, I'm very hesitant to believe uh, on settlement because that seems to me a real possibility. Um, but they're not interested in that. So as far as crappy neighbors, I think the quarry fits that definition all the way. The country club, they have done some improvements. Have they done as many improvements as I would like? Absolutely not. Um, when they put in the paddle courts and the new pool, they did expand drainage. Uh, we had engineers meeting with their engineers, demanding what we could that they expand drainage. Could they do more? Absolutely. Would I hope that they would do more? Absolutely. Would the village work with them if they were willing to do more? Absolutely. Unfortunately, the country club is an unincorporated Cook County. It's not in LaGrange. So I can't say we're putting up a stop work order or something. We don't have jurisdiction over them. With regard to the berm on Brainerd Avenue, that was one of the requests that we made to the country club. They studied it, reviewed it, thought about it, and told us no. MWRD told us we can't build that berm unless the country club gives us permission. We, we tried and, and we, we couldn't go any further. And, and that's unfortunate, but that's what, what we did there. There was, and I don't have the engineering that's involved, but there was a change several years ago to Brainerd Avenue. The, the road was changed. I believe it was lowered, which causes some problem. I think it accepts more water than it did in the past. Um, and that was done, I believe, again, it's an IDOT road, and I believe it had to do with the driveways and trying to, to make it more accessible to the people that lived on the east side of, of Brainerd. I'm not positive of that, but again, not talking off my top of my head, and we can look into that and, and respond in more detail. But I do believe that that did happen some time ago, and it did cause a change on that. Um, there's, and again, we can have uh, Paul come back up and talk about this a little bit, but there is two different flooding issues. There's the stormwater that comes over land and is flowing generally from the west to the east. Um, and, and that, again, is stormwater. That should not have the feces and everything unbelievable mixed in. I'm not saying you want it in your house. Obviously, you don't. But it's different than the people that have, and maybe you're experiencing both, that have water that comes up through your lowest point, which is generally your sewer in the basement. Um, that happens when the deep tunnel fills up and moves into the lowest point. That's where other villages have looked at what they can do to help offset some costs. That's where, where in my house I put in the overhead sewers to prevent that from happening. That is a policy question, and I think it's a, a valid question to, to ask on should that occur? And I think the residents should give feedback. One of the concerns with that is there's obviously limited funds. And is it equitable to now start paying or paying half or paying some portion uh, of those projects when other neighbors just did it a week ago, just did it a year ago, just did it 10 years ago? And that's the balancing act. But your opinions on that, I know this board would, would take to heart and, 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 and seriously. Um, 
as far as things that we had, we did not, have not done that yet, but that doesn't mean it's closed. Uh, we, we can definitely consider, we will consider that if, the, if there's support in the community. Uh, things we did do was waive permitting fees, and we can continue to do that. Say, if you're trying to address the situation, how can we waive the permitting fees and things like that? And again, that's something that we can continue to consider and, and take feedback from. Uh, we also, uh, Village Manager Peterson did call Flood Brothers to ask them to work with the neighbors on removing debris. So the debris should have been removed. There shouldn't be debris left north of 47th. Garbage day was this morning. Um, I haven't heard reports on whether it all got removed or not, but we asked them to, uh, you know, it's Flood Brothers, or Irish Compassion Family Business, to show a little compassion, and, and we hope they did. Um, so those are things about now, what we can do. Um, again, I understand the frustration, um, the little plans, not enough, things like that. This is particularly to the people on 50th Street, a couple of blocks north or south of 50th Street. This isn't a little project. This isn't a small project. This isn't something that other villages are doing. This is unique to LaGrange. It's unique to LaGrange, and it wasn't me, it was President Tom Livingston that did it, really working with Trustee Matucci, uh, before he was a trustee. And Trustee Matucci, I know, will tell you, he's a trustee because he cares about this flooding project. This is probably his top 100 priorities, and 101 might be very distant. So, the, the, but they passed a referendum. They worked to pass a referendum, and the residents supported the referendum. The residents throughout town, from every section of town, supported the referendum to say, we know over there they need flood relief. We know that the families are devastated. We want to provide that. And because of that, we were able to go to bonding and get $14 million. Again, for a, the, the village the size of LaGrange to commit $14 million to a sewer project is a big commitment. Other communities aren't taking $14 million. Other communities have had more luck with getting MWRD to come in. Other communities have had more luck with their quarries taking water. Other communities have had more luck in getting federal grants. We've worked on all of that, and we will continue to work on it. But the reason that we're focused on that project, that 50th Street Storm Sewer project, is because we've hired engineers. We've looked at it, and Trustee Gale and former Trustee McCarty studied the alternatives, studied the alternatives that residents uh, suggested. And what was clear was the way to get the most water out is in a sewer, in transferring it from west to east, and it eventually has to get to the McCook Ditch. Those are certainties. And so, again, that's the reason. That's an expensive project. That was an expensive project six years ago, and it's not a cheaper project now. It's going to cost every bit of $14 million for us to have a sewer that goes from Brainerd into that quarry. So why don't we do other projects? What's plan B? Well, there's a problem. If we spend $5 million of that $14 million on a plan B today, now we have $9 million. The $9 million doesn't do the 50th Street Storm project. So we don't have plan A because we spent some of the money on, on plan B. So that's the problem of why we can't do some other incremental projects. And I get the frustration. I, I get that it's taking a long time. <clears throat> but th those are the reasons. The litigation. What occurred was the quarry filed a lawsuit. The case was getting very close to settlement. The settlement uh, or to trial. The parties reached a settlement, thought they reached a settlement. It was a tentative settlement. There were three parties involved, the quarry, the village, and MWRD. It took years of drafting and working on trying to get the terms of the settlement. I became the president uh, a year ago, February, and it 
then was my responsibility. Where are we on drafting? Where are we getting this done? Let's move this forward. <clears throat> and we did attempt to get all the parties together to try to settle. Unfortunately, the MWRD said you need to spend equal amounts. We're going to spend money on a reservoir. You need to spend equal amounts on a sewer project. We have $14 million from a bond. The quarry was contributing $9.1 million, and that, again, was by their title company. That's $23 million. We're somewhere between 7 and $12 million short on that. We couldn't enter that agreement because we can't get there. Do I believe that there's ways to get there? Yes, but it's going to take something from the MWRD, something from the federal government, something from IDOT, something from the county. And we will continue to be willing to work with them. But why? So in February, we looked at that, the, the settlement blew up by December. And we looked at, okay, there's no settlement. We need to go to trial. It's, we had good attorneys before. I think we brought in better attorneys to finish the job. And so we did that. And they're charged with getting us a trial. They'll work their hardest to get to that. Um, I do want to uh, ask Paul or, or, or from Baxter and Woodman about removing the uh, sewer grates and how that helps or hurts and things. I know that Trustee Matucci is a big fan of moving the sewer gates. I'm just not sure engineering of how it helps. And, and before I do that, though, I, I, the traffic is an issue. It's an absolute issue um, that needs to be <clears throat> addressed and worked with. We, we shut down intersections that we know are going to flood. But doing so, we know it's also going to move traffic. We, we, we can't have the deepest intersections open, so we have to close those down, and that has to move traffic. And then you ask, well, why don't we close the next one down and the next one down? But where, where, where are we moving the traffic? When is it going to be opened and things like that? It creates problems. Um, but we can work at that. We can do better on that. Uh, we can study that, I, I'm convinced. But I'm, I'm saying this mainly to the people at home. Quit driving through the flooded intersections. A lot of the drivers that are coming here are residents. They're our neighbors. That storm was a quick storm. Yes, it took hours for the water to go away. Don't drive for those hours. You are creating damage when you drive down those streets. You are pushing water off the streets, onto the yards, into window wells, into people's houses. It's dangerous for you as a driver. It's devastating for the homeowners. We need to stop. One of the people who wrote me said that because Brainerd was closed and a, a, a delivery was being made to the, the Jewel and Countryside, that a truck came down her block. That's obviously not appropriate. We don't want that um, happening. Uh, and, and we'll work to try to prevent those type uh, of activities because it's causing damage. So um, I, I apologize that I haven't answered all of your questions. I'm, I'm sure I haven't. Um, the uh, I'm looking through and seeing if I marked one that I wanted to make sure. Um, uh, I just saw the note about the neighbor who thanked Russell Davenport. Uh, I do appreciate our, Russell and his team's efforts, as well as all of our chiefs and their team's efforts. Uh, yes, at 2 in the morning, our public works are out there working when needed, whether it be this flood event, a winter storm, or, or anything else. Uh, they work hard. They care deeply about our community. They're professional, and they do a great job. So I appreciate their efforts. Um, and this isn't a community uh, where you'll drive around and see village employees just standing around doing nothing. Uh, they, they don't do that. They work hard. They, they treat it, you know, like, like it was their house flooding. They want to help you. As far as answering the, those cards, 
and going on the web page. So on our web page, we asked, have you suffered any flood damage? Do you want a callback? That information is important. It allows us to go to the Congresswoman Newman and say, hey, we had 100, 150, 200 people fill out these cards. Devastation. We need help. So it does, even if you did it last year, it helps us. Secondly, if you're new to this and you invite Public Works out, they can try to assist you with answering questions, telling you, we think that this type of system would help. We think, you know, changing your gutters or downspouts here would help. Different things they may be able to provide you with useful information, and I would recommend taking advantage of that. Um, so, so again, uh, I guess before I, I ask Paul to come up, I would just ask if any trustees want to express any comments. Okay, Paul, if you if you could. So one of the comments, and I, and I hear it quite, quite frequently, is um, what, what should people do during the height of the rain event? While their streets flooded, um, uh, what should they do? And kind of very related to that is why does it appear that some intersections clear before other intersections? Um, and I'm putting you on the spot, so obviously if you're not familiar or can't, you can always come back and, and answer that later. Yeah, I think the first the first question, can you hear me? Yes. The first question, it's uh, very situational. You know, what, what one resident might, what might be helpful for one resident might not be helpful for the next, depending on the type of flooding you're experiencing. Um, your question about the, the rates, it is certainly possible that those are getting clogged during storm events with debris, trees, garbage, I don't, you know, that can happen, and uh, our analysis that we prepared during the final design of the 15th Street Relief Storm Sewer, uh, we it was detailed enough that we had every inlet accounted for in the model. Um, and we had a very complex model of the ground surface to try to assess areas where we needed more inlet capacity, and that model showed that, uh, that the capacity of the main line sewers were the limiting factor there. But that, that uh, assumed that the inlets were fully open and available to flow. So when those are getting clogged, that can certainly be an issue. It, it, this, the residents that are experiencing this aren't thinking that they're, they're clogged. They, they, residents have seen where debris has gone over the catch basins, these covers, and it clogged it, and they religiously remove any debris, especially when a storm's coming. Um, they've experienced, or they, they, they think, um, that by removing an unclogged grate, it will somehow cause water to go down. Yes, I guess it is, po it is possible that in areas that are um, in an isolated area, that removing the grate would increase the capacity of that location as long as the pipe has the ability to take additional flow. Okay. I don't think there is an inlet capacity issue, but there could be certain locations where that is limiting flow of the sewer and limiting the, the ability of the sewer to generate that flow. Okay, and, and what I think I'm hearing you say is you don't think there's a limiting input capacity. And by that, you mean it's not that the top of the sewer is the problem. I mean, they, they, it's big enough, the issue is there's nowhere for it to go. It's an outflow problem. The sewer pipe is, is filled and no more water is allowed in. Yes, in total, but there, there could be specific locations where additional inlet capacity could provide benefits. Okay, thank you on that. Is there a reason why some intersections seem to drain before other intersections? I think I could answer that question better if I knew which intersections were being discussed, but I think a lot of it just has to do with the, the elevation that some of those intersections are at. Well, I, I think in this storm, we had 50th at Spring might have been the last intersection to drain, and the one before that may have been around 47th and LaGrange Road. Um, 
So I don't know if that helps you or not. So 50th and Spring, it's one of the low-lying depressional areas. It's also the closest one to the country club. So when storm water is flowing through the country club over Brainerd Avenue, that's the first depression that it gets to. And then from that point, it has to spill on, spill over, but it has to fill up and then spill on to the next, the next depression. Um, so yeah, that's it's kind of gets the first wave of water that's, that's, that's flowing through the country club. Okay. Um, thank you. Do, any of the trusted, trusted Matucci? So, <clears throat> President Kukler, so we've talked about the, the, the greats. Many of the people here have stood out there in the water with me doing this. Um, so for me, it's pretty simple. Like, you have a cup, right, and you've got a grate on it, and I've stood there. I mean, it is, it is irrefutable from <laughs> just visual evidence. If you cover half of it, which is basically what a sewer grate is, less water is gonna go in it, right? You cover half your drain, the water goes down slower. That's essentially what a sewer grate is. And for some reason, it seems to me that there's some capacity at the top of that sewer where you have that sewer in the middle of the street, which is higher than the sewers in the corner of the street, where when it's really full, nothing's going on any sewer, right? But when the water starts to drain, going you know back to 2014, if you take that off, the center one will start to cyclone as soon as you take it off. Either you prop it up sideways in it or you remove it and then stand there and it falls in it. The residents shouldn't be doing that. I think we should be doing that um, You know, from the Public Works folks and they were out there in force um, on Saturday doing that. And I stood there with them both at Spring and 50th in the water and with Frank at, at Wyola uh, and 50th and put it down, the cyclone stops in your drain, you prop it up either upright or off and the water just goes down faster. I mean, there's other people here who can attest to that, and I'm sure some of the folks on Russell's now, you know, the, that, that, that's not the problem. That is a Band-Aid on the fact that there is insufficient capacity to go out, but it's what we can do in real time, in my view. I think we should, God forbid we have one of these. I literally can't believe we had an event again two years in a row, um, but it's what we can do in real time until we have a longer solution. Thank you, Tristan Matucci. All right, seeing no other questions. Again, thank you. The meeting's gonna go on, but th thank you all for, for coming. Uh, you're all welcome to stay. You're also welcome to email uh, or call uh, either the board or uh, any, the, the village. And we'll try to answer any question that we didn't answer tonight or that you, you have moving forward. Moving on, is there a president's report? I mean, a village manager's report? Thank you, Mr. President. The village encourages residents and businesses to register for the Rave Alert Smart 911 system to stay informed of weather and other emergencies. Residents may choose the types of notifications they receive and how to receive them. Our, our one sign up uh, uh, portal includes both programs, and there is no cost to participate. Please visit the village's website at www.lagrangeil.gov and click on the emergency alert sign up button on the front page to register. Also, the village hall will be closed for services on Monday, July 5th in observance of the Independence Day holiday. Normal business hours will resume on Tuesday, July 6th. Online options are available on the village's website and a full complement of emergency personnel will be available throughout the holiday. Thank you. Thank you, Manager Peterson. Um, at this time, I would ask Clerk Saladino uh, to read the items on the consent agenda, followed by the items under current business. 
Matters on the consent agenda will be considered by a single motion and vote because they've already been considered fully by the board at the previous meeting or been determined to be of routine nature. Any member of the Board of Trustees may request that an item be moved from the consent agenda to current business for separate consideration. Item A, contract leaf hauling and disposal. Item B, contract 2021 crack filling program. Item C, an ordinance, disposal of property from police department, fire department, and administrative department. Item D, the minutes of the Village of LaGrange Board of Trustee regular meeting Monday, June 14th, 2021. And item E, consolidated voucher 2106-28. And then the matters under the uh, current business. Got it. This agenda item includes consideration of matters being presented to the Board of Trustees for action. Item A, special event, annual downtown LaGrange Craft Fair. Thank you, uh, Clerk Selenio. Um, at this time, I would ask if, if there's anybody in the audience uh, with any comments regarding matters on the uh, agenda. Seeing none, uh, I would ask for a motion and a second on the consent agenda. I move we accept the uh, consent agenda as presented. A second. Thank you, Trustee Gale, Trustee McGee. Uh, before we start, I think we need, yep, Trustee Yeah, McKinney. thank you, Mr. President. I'd like to recuse myself from the vote on item E in the consent agenda, consolidated voucher 210-628. Uh, as I have a conflict with check number 153906. Thank you, Trustee Kutinik. Any other comments regarding current, the consent agenda? If not, I would ask Clerk Saladino to do a roll call vote. Trustee Gale? Aye. Trustee Kutinik? Uh, aye on items A through D and abstain from item E. Trustee Matucci? Aye. Trustee McGee? Aye. Trustee Peterson? Aye. <coughs> Trustee Augustine? And that passes unanimously. At this time, I would ask Trustee Matucci to introduce the special event downtown craft fair. Thank you, President Kukler. Uh, we have a request from the LaGrange Business Association related to the LaGrange Craft Fair. Um, the last time this event was held was 2019, and due to the COVID pandemic, um, it was not held in 2020. Uh, 2019 uh, marked the first time that this was a three-day event, uh, a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and they are seeking approval uh, to have another three-day event uh, this time for Friday, July 16th, Saturday, July 17th, Sunday, July 18th, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. each day. Uh, thousands of people will come in. This is a very popular event. Uh, brings a lot of foot traffic to LaGrange and to the local businesses. Um, and uh, the requests are specifically related to that. Typically, uh, Harris Avenue from LaGrange Road to Ashland Avenue uh, is closed along with a portion of Madison Avenue in addition to village parking lots three and four. Um, this year, slightly different from last year, they're looking to occupy part of the Cosset School blacktop area adjacent to Harris Avenue um, in addition to uh, the use of Harris Avenue in the village parking lots. And this will provide some benefits to avoid uh, craft fair booths on the Grange Road sidewalks uh, so as to not conflict um, with the ongoing um, sidewalk uses and permits we have with uh, some other restaurants. And we'll also allow for some greater spacing and distancing for COVID-19, as well as for some larger booths um, not having to be planted on the sidewalk. Um, 
given the reduction in available parking uh, due to the modified site plan, the LGBA secured arrangements for additional off-site parking at Lyons Township High School's North Campus. A shuttle service will provide transportation between the high school parking lot and the craft fair. Additionally, uh, the staff, uh, the village staff, and the LGBA propose to allow free customer parking and metered parking spaces during the craft fair. Uh, the village has reviewed the request and recommends approval of the event subject to the following conditions, which I will read. That all licenses and permits be obtained to the satisfaction of the village. Permits and insurance coverages. That the village maintains final approval of site security, parking, and utility plans. That a hold harmless agreement be signed by Craft Productions and the LaGrange Business Association. That Craft Productions Inc. must ensure that all vendors sign a participant acknowledgement, release, and waiver. The LaGrange Business Association must secure all necessary permissions from Cossett School and the Lyons Township High School for use of their properties. That all affected property owners and tenants shall be notified in writing of the proposed street closures no less than two weeks prior to the event. That portable toilets are be delivered Thursday morning by 8 a.m. Portable toilets, general refuse dumpster, and recycling dumpster are, be to, are to be removed before the start of business at 8 a.m. on Monday, July 17th. All costs incurred by the village for materials and labor are to be reimbursed by Craft Productions. Vendors are to be notified that no displays or merchandise are to be placed in village planters. Vendors must park in off-site locations as detailed in the Craft Fair production letter agreement so as to minimize the impacts on customer parking. They ask that if we concur, the village board formally need approval, um, needs to approve the closure of Harris Avenue from LaGrange Road to Ashland Avenue, Madison Avenue from Harris to just north of Madison Avenue entrance to parking lot eight, village parking lots three and four. Uh, additionally, as I mentioned, it is also recommended that the village board direct staff to temporarily waive enforcement of metered parking for the duration of the event. Um, I believe that we will have somebody from the LGBA um, here if any of the trustees have any questions uh, about the proposal and the craft fair. Thank you, Trustee Matucci. And we have Nancy Cummings, of course, from the LGBA. We appreciate you coming out, and we always appreciate all your efforts. Um, do you want to say anything, or are you just here to answer any questions? All right. Well, this then I would ask for a motion uh, on the uh, special event to allow the annual downtown LaGrange craft fair. I would make a motion for the uh, recommendations uh, of staff to close the streets, relieve the, the parking permits, um, expenses for the uh, metered parking, and all the other items listed. Second. Thank you, uh, trustees. Um, any uh, questions or any questions or comments regarding the motion? I see none. Thank you again to Nancy Cummings for coming out for the LGBA. Thank you to all the, the volunteers uh, that are involved in the craft fair. Uh, it really does. It's one of those signature events. It's very well attended. People do literally come from miles and miles around into LaGrange. It really promotes uh, our village and all of our, our businesses uh, do very well that weekend. Um, it takes a lot of volunteers, I know, and we do appreciate it. So please, Nancy, express our appreciation uh, to everyone. Uh, with that, I would ask uh, the Clerk Saladino call a roll call vote. <clears throat> Trustee Gale. Aye. Trustee Katinik. Aye. Trustee Matucci. Aye. Trustee McGee. Aye. Trustee Peterson? Aye. Trustee Augustine? And again, or I should say not again, that passes unanimously, and we welcome uh, the art fair. Happy that, uh, that we're allowed to have people gathering. It's fantastic. At this time, I would ask if there's any public comments regarding matters not on the agenda. And we'll let John come up to the microphone. Thank you, President Kukler. Thank you, Manager Peterson and, and community development, all the staff. We know how hard you work, and sometimes there's difficult issues. Um, I feel for the people that spoke tonight. When I was a kid in LaGrange in the 1960s, we had flooding on the 500 block of Madison. Um, 
you know, if, if a sump pump breaks, it's a problem. If you have these kinds of storms we have, it's horrendous. But I know the village has worked hard on this project, and I, I commend President Kukler and the rest of the staff who have been spending many years working on this issue. I myself went through the entire south of 47th area and the, um, the uh, east side of LaGrange Road with flyers promoting the referendum back in 14. Uh, we knew it was important then. It's even more important now. And we'll get a solution, but I, I, I understand how difficult it's been. Um, this issue is, is almost trite by comparison, but I wanted to mention it because there's two days left for comments on the forthcoming code changes and community development procedures, so I just wanted to bring up a few things for what it's worth. Uh, by and large, none of the code adoptions should be cause for concern. Certain things can be prohibited should the Board of Trustees decide. Um, I noticed that during the last board meeting, the discussion about the sprinklers was brought up. Um, 29 states have prohibited requiring sprinklers in new home construction. I'm sure they had reasons for doing that. Uh, 19 states, including Illinois, do allow local municipalities to choose to opt out of that requirement. Uh, as for the recommendations that were in the report, uh, evaluating implementing changes to building permitting processes and standards to improve permit and licensing, customer service <laughs> efficiency and accountability, et cetera. Um, on the zoning board, we had some issues with contractors either not being straight up with their, with their customers, with the people who hired them, or customers who weren't paying attention to their responsibility with respect to permitting. But I would recommend that, um, well, certainly contractors, plumbers, electricians, et cetera, who apply for and obtain permits are, for homeowners are the, are the ones that are licensed and insured. Uh, otherwise, they don't get the <coughs> permit. I have to believe that 80 to 90 percent of the permits pulled are done by the plumbers or electricians or HVAC people, not the actual residents themselves. But the homeowner is liable, so communication at the time of permitting is important. So one suggestion would be to recommend that when permits and requirements are provided, whether it's be via email, which I understand happens, mailed or in person, to the contractors, plumbers, and electricians, that the homeowner also be copied to avoid surprises and complications. Um, if the homeowner's on the hook for the contractor's failures, then not copying them on the permitting paperwork is doing them and the village a disservice. It creates extra work, grief, and expense for all in terms of time and money later on. And um, I, I understand new software is in the offing and that sort of thing to help automate the process. So adding a CC to the homeowner at the time a permit is, is emailed to a company, to a, a contractor would be relatively easy, I would think. Um, also, if the village, village feels that pre-work inspection is required, maybe that visit should take place prior to the permit being issued, if the job is, is, not, is, is considered not routine. Um, a little bit more about that later. In terms of the Building Board of Appeals, which I notice is uh, a possibility, I strongly recommend that this entity be put into place and the majority of the members be comprised of property owners within LaGrange. Um, in terms of the existing building code, I'm sure that most of the Board of Trustees, like me, probably live in residential housing that's 50 years old or older. Outside of Mason Point, how much land is available for new construction outside of the normal progression of teardowns and large-scale renovations? Therefore, I'm assuming that most of the permitting and licensing is done for work done in existing homes. A positive goal of the new plans is to increase compliance with permitting. That means making it simpler, more understandable, and less time-consuming and complex for the homeowners. During the 15 years since I moved back to LaGrange, I've seen a huge increase in the number of required permits, and therefore, logically, the sheer number of permits. Um, I recently had a small project in early June that I applied for a permit for. It was permit number 2153. So I'm not exactly sure, but this probably means that if you double that for the next six months, there must be four to 5,000 permits issued this calendar year or close to it. Uh, that's a lot of admin time evaluating and inspecting, a lot of it for potentially for relatively minor work. Uh, the village used to um, issue counter permits for simple work. These are now called next day permits. Uh, the things that require a plan review is larger, the categories is larger than it's ever been. 
Um, I believe it's being required for things that many municipalities might consider relatively minor and that LaGrange itself used to as well. Uh, but municipalities have wide discretion in this area. And by plan review, I'm not speaking of floor plans or house additions. I'm talking about simple things like using a licensed village approved electrician who obtains a permit to, to add a new code compliant circuit or something like that. Apparently something like that requires um, a pre-site inspection. This kind of thing doubles the amount of site visits per year. So think of the admin cost of that. Um, is it really necessary? If 5,000 permits are issued in LaGrange, that means, assuming that a lot of them uh, require the pre-work site visit, that could be eight to 10,000 visits by inspectors per year, which is um, a, lot, a lot to keep up with for the inspector or contractors if the village has to go out and hire some. Code is code, it's not subject to interpretation. If the work done is not found to be up to code, then the contractor's responsible for fixing it. That's one, one of the reasons we require a surety bond, and that's also why there are lawyers. Uh, the criteria for pre-certification or on-site approval of a minor repair should be the dollar value of the project, a $6,000 sewer repair, of course, an electrical circuit in 2021 for under $1,000, not so sure about that, Discretion and common sense ought to prevail with these smaller repairs or upgrades. Um, I would recommend that the Community Development uh, Department, the Board of Trustees, and the respective village commissions take time to look at this and not necessarily rush into an August 1st adoption, although I know during the month of July there's a month to, to, to go through these things. Um, take the time to, for the sake of administrative efficiency, the village budget, and some deference to residents who are trying to keep up with their older homes, uh, their older housing at a reasonable cost while complying with the adopted codes. If you look around at our beautiful village, 142 years after its incorporation, it's aged well and will do so in the future because our homeowners want to keep it up and love LaGrange. And we've got problems, but I know we can <coughs> solve them if we work together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pappas. We appreciate uh, your suggestions, and I know staff will uh, look into um, evaluating those and where appropriate, uh, make the appropriate recommendations. So thank you. Thank you for your continued involvement in, in LaGrange, and we're happy to see you at the meeting. Uh, any other comments on matters that were not on the agenda? At this time, I would ask if there's any trustee comments. Trustee Gale. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I think at our last meeting, uh, I talked about the intersection of 47th and Brainerd. Yes. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I was wondering if um, staff, and I'd be happy to even take a first crack at a draft. Um, my understanding is the lighting there is controlled by IDOT. Um, could we maybe send a letter to IDOT saying, hey, can you look at that, um, that intersection and that light um, just to see if there's a way to change the lighting? Uh, I just received a couple other comments from, from residents about, about the safety there. I know it's not the highest, um, highest one on our list in terms of accidents or issues, but um, at least then we can put, you know, put the, the heat on them without us expending any other resources trying to evaluate it to say, hey, can you take a look at this? We're, you know, we're seeing issues. Uh, thank you, Trustee Gal. Uh, just for the people watching at home, uh, the, the corner of 47th uh, in Brainerd, um, I think it's it, traveling uh, westbound, but I could be wrong. One of the ways westbound or eastbound, you don't have a left dedicated green turn, and uh, some residents contacted Trustee Gal regarding why that is. Um, and Russell Davenport reached out to KLOA, which is our uh, traffic consultants, and they explained that it's an IDOT road. Here's some of the thoughts about IDOT. IDOT makes those decisions, um, but you can always write to IDOT and, and ask them uh, to reconsider. So I think Trustee Gales uh, asking staff to, to, to write a letter, and I, I think that's fine. We can do that. Um, Again, from our previous experiences with IDOT, those aren't uh, met with much success, but it's definitely, I think, a worthwhile effort and something that uh, some residents obviously are concerned about. So uh, I'm sure staff will get that out this week. 
So thank you on that. Um, any other trustee comments? Uh, seeing none, I again just want to, to thank all the trustees uh, for all their, their efforts uh, this weekend uh, in the, and in, in you know, all the past weekends. Uh, you do a great job of meeting with the res residents, trying to uh, explain what we do up here and why we're trying to do it, uh, and, and just really a lot of times allowing them to vent. So thank you uh, for, for all those efforts. Uh, it is appreciated. It does make a difference. Uh, and at that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Second. Trustee. Thank you, Trustees. Uh, and then a voice vote. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye. And again, unanimous. And we are adjourning at 9.52. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>